Skagway, a major port in 98, is still abuzz with activity. Here the stampeders, scallywags, and scoundrels landed on their way to the gold fields. And here, the first rails of the White Pass were spiked down. Is it any wonder that tens of thousands of Americans are still drawn to this Mecca? And at the center, the White Pass Depot, a haven for those enchanted by this living link with another time. is one of the last operating narrow gauge railroads in North America. It is certainly the very last railroad which carried freight and because of that you might say it was the last of an entire breed, an era. And it is doing more or less today what it did back in 1898 as a passenger railroad. It's still hauling people from tidewater at Skagway, Alaska up over the coast mountain range to the headwaters of the Yukon River. The company that originally got the idea of building the White Pass and Yukon Railway was the British Columbia Development Association Limited. This was a little group of uh, people in England who thought it would be a great idea to come out to the Western Canada and uh, try and develop some sort of a bridge between Western Canada and the Orient. And this was a good uh, place to invest some money. So they sent out a man by the name of Charles Herbert Wilkinson. And Wilkinson met a, a marvelous old gentleman by the name of Captain William Moore. And Captain William Moore convinced Charles Herbert Wilkinson that the place to invest your money was in building a railway from Skagway to the interior of the Yukon Territory, which he predicted there would be a great gold rush one day. Now this the prediction was made in 1887, ten years before the word of the Great Klondike Gold Rush, or the finding, the discovery of gold, reached Seattle, Washington. Wilkinson thought it was a good idea and decided to get in touch with his people in England and uh, develop this railroad. And in the meantime, he created three companies, one to cross the Panhandle, one to cross the Northern British Columbia, and one into the Yukon Territory. They were all formed, and he went back to England, but couldn't raise the money. And then he ran into us a group of people known as Close Brothers of London. And Close Brothers said, okay, we will lend you some money to build this railroad, and if you don't build it, or you don't pay us the money back, we'll have the right to build it ourselves. Probably the most impressive thing about the railroad is the scenic grandeur that you see from the line. Uh, it hangs precariously on the side of a, a thousand foot cliffs. It's got spiderweb wooden trestles and, uh, and old snow sheds and slide galleries and uh, cascading waterfalls going down into Dead Horse Gulch down below the tracks. The scenery, the scenic railway of the world. I suppose the thing that I personally like about the White Pass is the fact that it's been operating all the way back to the Gold Rush. This is a d direct link with the Klondike Stampede of 1898. I mean, these parlor cars, many of them date back to the 1880s and the 1890s. They're, the the right-of-way itself was blasted out of the side of the cliff during the Klondike Gold Rush. This is an actual operating link back 
89.90 years, and because of that, you've got something here that's very, very special. It's uh, there are very few companies that can claim heritage all the way back to the stampede to the Klondike. It began in 1896 when three wandering prospectors discovered gold in the Klondike Valley. By July the following year, the fever was rampant. In Seattle, a ton of gold was dumped on the docks, and the rush was on. Black-suited and bowler-hatted, many traveled via the Lynn Canal to the Alaskan port of Skagway. From here, they struck out for the border, some through the White Pass with its infamous Dead Horse Gulch. No matter which way they came, the Northwest Mounted Police saw to it that each man entered Canada with the prescribed one ton of supplies, a process that would require many to make up to 40 trips up and down the pass. For those who overcame the first ordeal and were permitted into the Yukon, 500 miles still separated them from the Klondike gold fields. It was evident from the start that a properly organized transportation system was required. Wilkinson's group did not pay the money back. So Close Brothers took over the three companies and sent Sir Thomas Tankred, uh, Erastus Corning Hawkins, an engineer from the United States, and uh, John Hislop, a Canadian from uh, Canada, sent them up to Skagway to go through the White Pass to see if a railroad could in fact really be built into that territory. And Sir Thomas and they and Hawkins and Hislop did just that. They were staying at a hotel called the St. James Hotel in Skagway, and they were really discouraged. They'd gone through the pass, and it really didn't look very good. Sir Thomas was a bit discouraged because he was a famous old railroad builder, and he had uh, he'd like to tell Close Brothers it was a good deal, but it turned out that he just couldn't say it. The grades would be too steep. The winter could not be dealt with in terms of the drift, the snow, the avalanches. By quirk of fate, as the group retired to the bar to warm up after their trip on the trail, another fellow uh, came in to the uh, hotel, also uh, dirty and, and haggard after days, obviously, uh, in the saddle. A young gentleman named Michael J. Heaney. And he was a Canadian young railroad builder, he made his name in building the Canadian Pacific Railway as a young contractor and uh, he had gone up there as an independent surveyor all by himself, financed himself to see if a railroad could be built and he was convinced a railroad could be built so he came down to the St. James Hotel one night, walked in and met these three fellows who were just deciding to tell Close Brothers that they were not going to build a railroad and he convinced them that they should build a railroad and that he was the guy to build it. And that's the way it turned out. And that was the start of it. And they hired him on as the labor contractor. And later he became the contractor of record and in fact built the railroad. Heaney immediately began assembling together all of the tools and the manpower required to build a 110 mile railway in the middle of totally unsurveyed, un touched wilderness. They weren't even exactly sure that Heaney's rough survey was where they were going to put the track. Construction began on May 27, 1898. Within two months, Mike Heaney had the first passenger train running four miles towards the summit. Michael J. Heaney uh, always wanted to build railroads. It was born in him right from the very early days. In fact, he ran away from home at the age of 14 and ran to the CPR construction sites, and his elder brother found him there and took him back home. But by the time he reached 18, he was then let go, and he went back to constructing the railroad to the CPR, and he worked on there on the CPR till the day the railroad was completed in, um, in British Columbia. His exacting standards saw costs soar to $120,000 a mile, an astronomical figure for a narrow gauge railway. Here you had these great shoulders of granite uh, coming down from each side of a valley. And they interlocked like the giant teeth of a gear. 
and the railroad had to move in and around these giant shoulders. Now there was one place called Rocky Point where engineers of great repute simply said it's impossible to get a railroad around there. And uh, Michael J. Heaney did it. Uh, he did it again and again and again where it was regarded as a place that no railroad should be. The White Pass and Yukon Railway decided to, uh, to build their railway narrow gauge. The reason being, when you go to narrow gauge, the equipment is smaller, and you don't have to bring down as much rock that cuts through the rock, through the, uh, through the uh, great uh, barriers are all less. Uh, the, the, the corners where you go around, not so much rock, so it's cheaper. It's, it's, you call it an investment gauge, if you like. And uh, if the day ever arose when uh, the, uh, a bigger gauge was required, then you just simply widen the, uh, the grade and install a four foot, eight and a half standard gauge. And that was the reason. That was a Victorian way of getting things going. By July 29, 1900, the ordeal was over. Pass and Yukon arrived in Whitehorse with the driving of the spike on June the 8th, 1900. When the uh, rail was spiked down, the White Pass trains could connect to sternwheel steamboats on the Yukon River, which would then continue on down 400 miles to Dawson City. The steamboats that the White Pass operated were early on on the river with dozens of other companies' ships. But uh, the, the buccaneering spirit of the time, uh, driving freight rates uh, uh, so far down, made it impossible for anyone to make any money. The White Pass, therefore, went into the business in a big way. They actually bought out all of the steamers on the river and formed British Yukon Navigation Company, of which the Klondike, SS Klondike, uh, was uh, a flagship of that fleet. The Klondike excitement, the stampede, had lasted from July of 97, when word hit the outside world, through that incredible winter of 97-98 that gave us the images of men and women climbing up the 45 degree angles of the Golden Stair at the summit of the Chilkoot Pass. Those images were completely ended with the completion of the railway. The, the last grand adventure that the Klondike was of man against the elements with his horses or his pack on his back, that was ended by the creation of the, the grand Victorian age of the most modern transport system on the planet. The rail, the steam engine connecting to steam vessels, steam river boats. And the, the completion of the railway, the Golden Spike, the ceremony at Carcross in, in July of 1900, ending that period of northern history, changed everything and modern technology of the 20th century was now available to transport man and material from the tidewater at Skagway over the coast range and down to the gold fields at Dawson City, a trip which had taken six months, now took only six days. White Pass and Yukon Railway is really composed of three companies. One company operates in the uh, Yukon Territory and one operates across the northwest corner of British Columbia and one across the Panhandle in Skagway, from Skagway to the border. And those three uh, companies comprise the, ro the railroad, 110 miles. And uh, that together as a family name is called the White Pass and Yukon Route. Three months after the line was completed, it shivered beneath the first snowfall. The challenge of the White Pass winter, complete with its annual 30 to 40 feet of snow, was at hand. For the next 60 winters, the canyons and mountains echoed with the rumble of two giant snowblowers. The rotary plow, pushed by two steam locomotives, could slice its way through drifts up to 12 feet deep. 
Without the rotary crews, nothing moved. They were considered the elite of the railway. In the early 60s, Larry Sullivan was part of such a crew, one that suffered the worst blizzard conditions in living memory. It was 1962, I forget what month it is, it was in the winter time. But uh, uh, that particular trip, uh, we left Skagway and we had the 70 and the 71 for the two pushers and rotary number two, I believe. Oh, geez, it was blown like uh, crazy up there and uh, cold, north wind. And we got up uh, just this side of 20, 23 mile post. And uh, the rotary stopped, uh, a blue whistle that we stopped, and uh, they were running out of water. At a standstill, 23 miles from Skagway, their troubles had just begun. The basic problem for the rotaries had always been to keep a clear path behind them so they could return for fuel and water. There were other concerns, too. There was about a 10-foot drift they went into. Uh, the snow came in through the caboose, and uh, the uh, conductor and the uh, brakeman was up in the cupola, and it, it filled the caboose, and we got stopped. And uh, we sat there for four days. By the end of the week, another rotary fleet, 50 men, four bulldozers, a dog sled team, and the Alaska State Airline had been called into play. At its conclusion, an appreciative White Pass general manager stated, I can't pay enough tribute to the courage, plain guts, and endurance of the men. 25 years later, snow removal is still a big job. At the beginning of the summer season, bulldozers are let loose in the White Pass snow. Working as a team, they're more efficient than the rotaries. As for their lack of romance, few White Pass veterans would return to the good old days. In 1942, the U.S. government leased the line for the construction of the Alaska Highway. With 15,000 tons of freight to be moved every two weeks, more than the railway had handled in the previous 12 months, the company was clearly out of its depth. In October, the 770th Railway Operating Battalion moved in. Close behind were 26 additional locomotives, 258 cars, and all the expertise to do the job. For many, many years, Alaska had been trying to convince Congress in Washington that there should be a land link between the lower 48 states and Alaska. Quite reasonable. Well, after Pearl Harbor, there was no problem because Dutch Harbor had been bombed, the Japanese were on the move. Uh, how was Alaska going to be defended? Was it possible that a great mass of men were going to land in Alaska and make their way down through northern Canada and into the United States? It was a pincher movement. Almost overnight, uh, the uh, United States Army uh, with the approval and orders of President Roosevelt said build a tote road and get it moving so that we can get men and equipment and material up into Alaska to defend it. Well, when the one of the key places was at Skagway, Alaska. So the White Pass and Yukon Railway for the second time in its life found itself in the midst of a great human drama first being the Klondike Gold Rush, the second being World War II. 110 miles away in Whitehorse, a heavily populated military camp soon sprang up. With up to 17 trains a day running around the clock, bottlenecks quickly developed. Staff Sergeant Marvin Taylor was sent to Whitehorse. One morning, 8 o'clock, when we fell out, they said, uh, Taylor, take your platoon to Whitehorse load those rail cards and get them back and we'll bring you back in about 30 days. A lot of the contractors had their own little sightings in and uh, we would, uh, everything was priority and whichever contractors offered us two meals for that day, lunch and dinner, that's where we worked. It was a very exciting winter. The Army uh, battalion that operated the railroad of course was all railroaders basically. 
but they'd never operate under those conditions or that light of equipment. And uh, in the beginning, they just simply refused to accept advice from the older head that had been here and operated that railroad. And I remember one time, it was 21 days that they were stalled out there. But they go out there and try to buck those winter storms where they've been better off to lay back for a day and then attacked it. But uh, no, we know how to do this. And uh, they sure as hell didn't. The war over, the WP and YR emerged with its fabric in tatters and facing new competition. The highway that the White Pass helped to build now offered an alternative route to the Yukon. On a brighter note, tourism was re-emerging as a major player. This is a remarkable railroad because basically you had British financing, American engineering, Canadian contracting. And uh, as a matter of fact, you know, there's an old saying up north, there are two nationalities, or three nationalities in the, in the north. There's Americans, then there's Canadians, and there's white passers. <laughs> so they, you had this international concept when the railroad was being built. And uh, with, uh, with the American engineering, British financing, and Canadian contracting. They built the railroad. And this railroad went on all the way through the teens of the early years, into the Roaring Twenties and the Hungry Thirties. The railroad went on into the war years, World War II. And uh, the British people still, the board of directors, were still in London, England. They still ran this railroad from London. And uh, it wasn't until 1950 that they finally came around to realizing that in order for the railroad to play its part in the modern North, modern Canada, modern Alaska, that the railroad had to be revitalized and had to be run from Vancouver at least, or Whitehorse. By this time, mining and exploration were on the upswing. So too was a growing awareness of transportation costs to the territory. After careful analysis of the problem, White Pass prescribed the solution, the development of a fully integrated container system. It proved to be the world's first. With one bold stroke, White Pass had made transportation history again. A brand new ship, the Clifford J. Rogers, was commissioned. Built solely for the Yukon's ocean commerce, she could carry 200 five-ton containers. On arrival in Skagway, they were transferred to the railway. Reduced handling costs and an overall increase in shipping efficiency became the White Pass hallmark. To complete the system, new diesel-electric locomotives were purchased. The days of steam were over for now. Meanwhile, White Pass was well and truly in the 20th century. A decade later, Yukon's largest mine, Cypress Anvil, signed a contract with the railway to carry up to 370,000 tons of lead zinc ore a year. A record unbroken. In point of fact, the whole White Pass 
system was upgraded to accommodate the um, Cypress Anvil mine, which was going to be shipping out hundreds of thousands of tons of um, product every year, lead and zinc. And this meant new locomotives, new flat cars, uh, another ship. Clifford J. Rogers was, uh, was retired. Frank H. Brown was brought on, the most modern container ship in the world. It was joined later by a sister ship called the Klondike. And trucks were brought in, bridges were built, tunnels were blasted. A, a huge amount of money was spent in upgrading the kept on running up until about 1981, I believe the time was. And in 1981, the Cypress Anvil Mine, for reasons of its own, uh, closed down. This eliminated the basic tonnage for which the railroad had been upgraded to carry. And no longer could it afford to maintain uh, this, uh, this, uh, these facilities without the income of Cypress Anvil Mine. So under those circumstances, it was forced to close down. The closure of the railway on Skagway was like nothing that had ever happened here before. The railroad had never closed. For 84 years, there had been a constant rail operation here in Skagway. It had been a constant employer. 200 men were laid off uh, in a town of 914 people. We were forced to come up with something new and different. All aboard the Skagway streetcar! Hey! <laughs> and off we go! And ladies and gentlemen, on the 29th day of that month, the SS Queen, the mail steamer, comes around the point just like you did this morning. When the railway closed, there was a serious vacuum as far as our attractions in the town. Um, leaping into the fold were all sorts of uh, uh, creations, the tent cities, gold panning, uh, the uh, uh, helicopter flight seeing tours, my own Skagway streetcar company. Uh, my wife and I bought a fleet of antique automobiles, dressed ourselves in period costumes, uh, gave people sightseeing tours of Skagway through the historic residence. There's eight blocks of bliss laid out right here for your entertainment, folks. <laughs> Will everybody get another couple pictures of their ship in the harbor, maybe themselves with the city in the background? We're going to make our way next down to the old Gold Rush Cemetery, where I'm going to introduce you to Jefferson Randolph Soapy Smith. Okay. All aboard the okay. street car. When everybody arrived, the Americans arrived in Skagway, they all had rifles, ammunition, uh, six guns, and uh, this was the mode of operating in the, in the United States. They made their own laws to some extent when they're on the frontiers. And, uh, but there was good and there was bad. There were those who uh, wanted law and order, and there were those who said, we will become gangsters in this land and, and, and run this town. And one of them was Soapy Smith. And he had a gang of thugs which virtually controlled the town. Smith decided that it would be a great idea to set up a little gambling den up on the grade, up near White Pass. Mike Heaney heard about this and he said, uh, told Foy, his uh, railroad superintendent, go down and tell that fellow to hop it get off the grade and go back to Skagway. And the um, Soapy Smith man told Foy, you can't shut me off here. I have as much right to be here as you have, which he had. 
So uh, Foy went back and told Mike Heaney that, uh, that the man wouldn't go. Soapy's man would determine to stay where he was. So Mike went down with Foy to where the man was, and he said in a very loud voice, Now, uh, Mr. Foy, I want you to bring that, um, that cliff down tomorrow, so load it with dynamite, and it will blast it at 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning, Foy got up and uh, set the fuse, went down and told the man that he was going to be blowing the cliff down. They would cover up his tent and kill him. And the man wouldn't have uh, said, no, you're just bluffing. So Foy eventually lit the fuse and said to Soapy Smith's man, this cliff is coming down in 50 seconds. If you want to live, you better get out now. And half an hour later, Foy was able to see uh, Michael J. Heaney and report that the Soapy Smith man was last seen running down the trail towards Skagway in his underwear. This is the most unique railway in the world. It, uh, it was born of an incredible event. It uh, lived an amazing, multifaceted, adventurous life. It has all of the intrigue and all the adventure and all of the nostalgia and the romance of, of any railway line with a few extra added salt and peppers to make it totally unique. When it closed, it was the last freight hauling narrow gauge common carrier left uh, uh, in, in, in the countries, in Canada or the United States. And as such, the White Pass wasn't it wasn't a candy-coated dance-all dream. And it stayed, it lay dormant for a while. And there were various rumors that uh, it was going to start up again. Uh, the mine was going to start up again. Uh, this was happening, that was happening. But uh, there was never any real justification. But then Skagway had in the meantime had become a really very important destination for travelers, tourists, always had been. But there was many uh, cruise ships coming up, loaded with passengers, eager to, to, to absorb the history of the, of the Trail of 98, the Klondike and all the rest of it. And, um, and almost by popular request, people said, oh, we hear about this wonderful White Pass Railway which incidentally has, goes through some of the most magnificent and awe-inspiring scenery in the world. That bit of railroad between Skagway and, uh, and, the, and the White Pass summit, I think is the most magnificent 20 miles of railroad anywhere in the world. No question about it. Sawtooth Mountains and the Great Glaciers. No wonder people said, bring it back. So the White Pass and Yukon route, listen to this. Tourism going through the port of Skagway, Alaska had doubled between the closure of the railway and uh, 1988. The White Pass Company made a gamble to attempt to operate a seasonal, summertime only passenger excursion train operation. And it was a success. In 1988, we uh, hauled 36,000 uh, passengers on the, on the train. And now what's happening is that instead of people asking about the little narrow gauge train that they hear might be running, People are calling us up on the phone saying, when does the train leave? The 110 miles from Skagway, Alaska to Lake Bennett, British Columbia and on to Whitehorse in the Yukon were the original main line. We have actually 40 miles of track in some form of passenger service. It would be nice to be able to reopen more of the railroad. We have to walk before we can run and in that respect it has been a, a, a major 
accomplishment for us to extend the service uh, into Canada and to become the last Canadian narrow gauge railway uh, operating passenger service. And of course then the 12 miles onto Lake Bennett uh, is a, a major piece of track to, to operate also. Climbing the Chilkoot, the Stampeders spent the winter of 97 here. Their destination was still 550 miles away. Their route, once the ice melted, was down the Yukon River. Here, hundreds of boats were built. The Mounties logged over 7,000 passing by their post at Tagish. And when they were not building boats, they built this church. When the ice melted, the boats were launched and the Stampeders were gone. The 73 is the last of the White Pass steam engines, and we don't have uh, a cornucopia of spare parts to keep the old puppy running. The uh, uh, company is continually scouring the world, trying to find material to keep the locomotive up and operational. There are, however, uh, a number of groups that have inquired about wanting to charter the locomotive, to be able to take it up the line for special group events to run it uh, up the hill and then bring it back down, say, for uh, uh, the Pacific Railroad Society or this type of groups, the rail fans. And uh, the company is, is looking at each of these proposals uh, with a very open mind to wanting to be able to charter the engine. And the crews loved the 70-class engines. There were only four of them constructed. Uh, the first in 1938, and the 73, of course, is the last of that fleet of four engines, the most modern of the bunch. She's uh, an inside frame 282, a very well-balanced uh, ability to not only work the mountain grade with a very sure step and, and haul very good heavy tonnage, but she also can roll very free across uh, flats on long tangent track. She uh, has a very special place in the hearts of the crew because of the stories of the 70-class engines, how they worked so well bucking the rotary fleet and, and uh, fighting the snow drifts because of their direct uh, power and their sure-footedness, and, and of course also because of their ability to handle the fast passenger run and excursion runs. on these special events.
The trains leave from Skagway and depart uh, out past the old Gold Rush Cemetery over the East Fork of the Skagway River, climbing up a 3.9 percent grade to Rocky Point. Then the track hangs along the side of the Skagway River up past uh, uh, Clifton with the overhanging rock and across Pitchfork Falls. And then uh, they go uh, past Bridal Vale Falls, coming down off the other side of the canyon, around past Glacier Station, and then the train climbs up along Slippery Rock. And along the bulkhead to the 15C trestle, and what we call the 16 Tunnel, which is across Glacier Gorge, the bridge goes into Tunnel Mountain, which was the only original tunnel on the line. And along the top of the world at Inspiration Point, where you can look back all the way down to see Skagway and the Pacific Ocean down below you. Climbing up even higher past along the edge of Dead Horse Gulch, where the original trail of 98 is pounded right into the rock by the horses back in 98. And it's there for everybody to see outside the train. And finally to the summit at White Pass at the U.S.-Canadian border. Beyond there, the trains continue across the top of the world, above the timberline. On eight miles to Fraser, British Columbia, and a place where passengers can get off the train and onto a connecting motor coach, a bus service that keeps on going up to Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory. We have an additional 12 miles of track from Fraser to Lake Bennett, British Columbia. I think that probably the comments we get from travelers, and there are, of course are those about how beautiful the scenery is or how uh, good the narration was on board, but I think the ones that I treasure more are those that come from the international traveler who has been around the world and has ridden railways in the Alps, railways in uh, the Himalayas, railways in the Andes, and the comments from the international railway traveler, who of course is a connoisseur of such uh, journeys, has been that the White Pass and Yukon route is the scenic railway of the world, that it ranks up with the greatest railway journeys from a scenic, uh, spectacular standpoint. Just as the railroad's tangible attributes inspire the visitor, so the intangible have inspired the staff. A product of Victorian energy and determination, the White Pass has imbued tremendous loyalty. I first met the company, or saw the company operating, in 1955. I was in the Canadian Army at the time, and uh, I was posted from Korea to, uh, to Whitehorse. And uh, when I first arrived in Whitehorse, I wondered whether, how I could get back to Korea. <laughs> it seemed to be more remote than, than the battle. However, uh, I learned about the railroad and uh, took an interest in it and uh, saw it operating for two years. And there seemed to be a, a family spirit in that railroad, which I had only seen in military units. Uh, there was a sense of camaraderie which is unique. And all this rooted in the Klondike Gold Rush. I, I thought it was a magnificent sort of an operation. <laughs> So I sort of fell in love with it. And um, while I was in the Army, I went down to Skagway uh, at the invitation of one of the officials of the White Pass and uh, saw more of its operation. And I began to take a few notes about the company with no idea of ever writing a book about it. But uh, as time went on, I decided that it was time for me to leave the Army. I'd been in it 20 years. And the White Pass, happily, asked me if I'd come and join them, which I did, as special assistant to the president. 
and I had all sorts of different jobs in the White Pass up until 1974. And, uh, but the, my reason for loving this company so much was because it was part and parcel of a group of people fighting for existence and fighting also to serve. There's a sense in the North of um, great interdependence, which, which you don't find outside this country. And uh, the White Pass and Yukon route provided a very important element, and that was food, and, uh, and also passenger services in and out of the country. So the White Pass was one of the roots of the existence of the, of the, of the Yukon Territory, and remains so, and still does today, though, though not to such great an extent, because you can get in there by airplane today, and you can fly food in, and you can truck it in. But the White Pass and Yukon route, as it originally was uh, organized, still exists today, and I'm naturally very proud of it. One feature of the ride not widely advertised is the variety of weather one can experience. Someone once said, if you don't like it, wait five minutes, and it'll change. The biggest problem we've had is that Mondays and Tuesdays, because of the stack up of ships in Skagway, the large cruise lines that come into town, were um, extremely hectic equipment demand wise on us. Uh, we had to run every single piece of passenger equipment we could, we could uh, muster. All 34 operating pieces of equipment had to be out running on the railroad on Mondays and Tuesdays for the sales opportunities. The demand was so high. So we would always get out and listen to the weather report the night before because one of the cars that we had, the roof leaked on one end of it there fairly badly and we hadn't had time to put the new roof on. We'd put a new coat of paint. It looked beautiful, but we needed to replace the canvas and we hadn't had time to do that yet. <laughs> so we were always out there at night waiting, praying to the dear Lord that it wouldn't rain <laughs> so the 270 would be able to be used <laughs> and we'd have enough seats for everybody. This is a remarkable railroad because basically you had British financing, American engineering, Canadian contracting. Haney immediately began assembling together all of the tools and the manpower required to build a 110 mile railway in the middle of totally unsurveyed, untouched wilderness. They weren't even exactly sure that Heaney's rough survey was where they were going to put the track. <laughs> <laughs>